Well, hello, Nativity Bible Heads. It is Dr. Wayne coming at you with your Sunday morning Power Bible Study. I hope everybody's doing well today. Today, uh, this the, the, the chapter that we're dealing with, the story that we're dealing with is, I believe, one of the theologically most quintessential chapters in the entire Bible. How do you like that? I hope you didn't, I hope I'm not overselling it. I really don't think I am because um, it just, it's, it's amazing. The, the lesson in this, in this uh, reunion episode, that's yeah, like, you know, like the, like, uh, like they do in television, the reunion episode, you know, when there's a, um, uh, okay. Let's, let's start at the beginning. No, not at the very beginning. The word Genesis does mean beginning. You know that, right? Um, <clears throat> so where were we last week? Joseph, Jacob's young son, not youngest, but he's kind of like treated like the youngest. Remember, Benjamin was actually the youngest. Jake, Joseph gets sold off by his brothers and he gets taken to Egypt. And uh, what happens between then and today is, well, big famine, big famine in, uh, in the land of Canaan, in the land of, that would uh, eventually be uh, called the promised land, uh, that land that was promised to Abraham and all his descendants, big famine. And where do you go when there's a famine in that part of the country. You go south to Egypt where apparently they learned how to do irrigation and grow stuff. So um, we all know the story about what happened to Joseph while he was there. I mean, who didn't see that old, I, I didn't actually see it. <laughs> there was a Disney movie called The Prince of Egypt, I think it was called. Uh, anyway. Um, Oh, uh, I did like that one movie that uh, was about Joseph. Um, I can't remember which one it was called. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, he is a um, big, uh, big wheel. He's not the king of Egypt. He's not actually a prince of Egypt. What he is, is like, he's in charge of a whole lot of stuff for the Pharaoh. The Pharaoh, remember the Pharaohs were, um, they, you know, kind of like, you know how you have your kings today, like, you know, in Britain, they got their kings, queens, whatever, royalty. They appoint people to do stuff, to day to day stuff. Joseph had earned a position of great responsibility and respect. <clears throat> and it just so happens that when you come to Egypt and you're looking for, you want food? Well, he's got the food. And in our episode today, chapter 45, verse one, <clears throat> it says, then Joseph could no longer control himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried out, send everyone away from me. What is, why, what, what couldn't he control himself about? Well, what had been happening was his brothers had come to him and they didn't know they were his brothers. They didn't know, they, they didn't, <laughs> Joseph knew that they were his brothers, but his brothers didn't know that he was Joseph. And so he was playing this little game with them of like giving them favors without them knowing. And um, there was just like a game going on. Um, also with regard to like, oh, uh, ben, uh, remember Joseph and Benjamin were the only two sons of the favored wife, Rachel. Joseph was the second youngest, Benjamin was the youngest. And so they were, the, Joseph was kind of playing this game about he really wanted, he, his favorite brother is his younger brother, Benjamin. And he really plays this game with him about like, Oh, you must bring to me uh, that child, that kind of thing. 
uh, because it was his youngest son. Um, and uh, the brothers were saying, oh no, dad won't let us do that because he's the youngest and uh, we can't. Um, anyway, so Joseph had been playing these games with them and that's what it means when it says he could no longer control himself. It's like, I gotta, I gotta, it comes a time, I gotta, I gotta tell people what's going on here. So that's why he said, send everyone away from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. Notice it doesn't actually tell, it doesn't narrate the uh, telling. All it says is that he told everybody, send them away. And then apparently he did it And in verse two, we are seeing the uh, reaction. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard it. So when he sends send him away, he's in the household of Pharaoh. And, um, and he's basically, it's like, it's like, okay, this is a moment that's just for us. This is, this is Israel's moment. This isn't for the Egyptians. This is Israel's moment. Now, just verse three. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him. So dismayed were they at his presence. So the brothers, why were they dismayed? The brothers were dismayed because they had poo-pooed Joseph's dream. Remember his dream? His dream was that this kind of thing would happen where he would be in charge and they would be coming to him for something. And they were afraid for their life. They were like, uh-oh, we are done. Because they knew Joseph was in a position of power and they had none. Complete turning of the wheels. So, verse four. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now, do not be distressed or angry with yourselves. Notice, <laughs> don't, be, like, don't be kicking yourself because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. What? Can you believe this? This is, the, this is a theologically grandiose uh, understanding of the way the world is and the way God is in the world that I tell you what, if you can't embrace life and circumstances of life like Joseph did, all you'll ever be is just pissed off in life. Because Joseph could have been that, right? He totally could have been that. His brothers wanted to kill him. They sold him to slavery. And now he's at this huge this position of power. God sent me here to preserve life. This is the reaction of wisdom to life's stuff. Not very many people reach this. Most people are so happy to sit in that pool, that self-pity pool, and say, well, this is the reason. Nothing ever works out for me. I've always been, I, I, I must have been born under a bad sign or 
Nothing ever works out for me. People always cut me off. I never win the lottery. I never get chosen. You know, that kind of kind of thinking. I tell you what, that's not gonna get anybody anywhere. That opportunity was totally there for Joseph. And you know what? You know where he came? You know where he went with all of that? God sent me here to preserve life. <sighs> Let's go on. I just love that, that, that purpose. I, that's like, I, should, I should be preaching on this. this I should be preaching on this, this uh, passage. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God, he says it again. God, verse seven, God sent me here before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. That's the life he's talking about. It's like, I am your sustenance. And he even, he keeps going on. He's like, just in case, I love that. Just in case you did not get my point, okay? He's been very, very clear about what he's trying to say, that all of this has been God's doing, okay? Verse eight, just in case you're not paying attention, he says, so it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh, Lord of all his house, and a ruler over all the land of Egypt. I hope that all of us can do the same thing when we look back on our lives, especially those things that we call, oh, those bad things, and say, it wasn't that, it was God. Now, this is not the same thing as well, everything happens for a reason. No, no, this is not that. That's something else. That's not even in the Bible. That's, that's popular theology. It's not even Christian. What I'm talking about and what's biblical, yes, does bad stuff happen? Yes. Was that a bad thing that his brothers did to him? Yes. But the idea of, oh, everything happens for a reason, that's not something that you tell somebody who's hurting. Oh, God doesn't give people anything more than they can handle. No, don't say that to somebody. If that makes yourself feel better, that's okay. I'm talking about in terms of ministering to people. God is in the business of transformation. Transforming something bad into something good. So, do bad things happen? Yes. Does is what God is doing with it the reason it happened? No, it's not the reason. What it is, is the activity of divine transformation in our life. When we let God transform ourselves, then we can look back on those things and say, oh, yeah. I 
see now. And that's a whole lot different than everything happens for a reason. No. All right. So, let's go on. Verse 9. That's a good sermon, isn't it? I, 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 I don't know what Scott's sermon was today, but it's like, that, that, was a good, that was a good one, right? Hurry, verse, I mean, uh, Genesis 45, verse 9. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, thus says your son, Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not delay you shall settle in the land of Goshen and you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children, as well as your flocks, your herds and all that you have. I will provide for you there. Remember the dream? Since there are five more years of famine to come so that you and your household and all you have will not come to poverty. Verse 12. And now your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my own mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father how greatly I am honored in Egypt. Remember, his father also poo-pooed one of his dreams. And all that you have seen, hurry and bring my father down here. So Mo Jacob is very, or Jacob, uh, Joseph is very motivated to get his father here. He want, really wants to have that reunion with his father. The reunion with the brothers is complete. All right, verse 14. Oh, listen to this. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept while Benjamin wept upon his neck. Those are, those are the two closest brothers. Uh, they were both, they had the same mom, same dad. So it's like they were closer to each other than any of his brother, other brothers. And verse 15, and he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. That is just a beautiful, beautiful picture of reconciliation. Yeah, we have a lot of crap. <laughs> We've got a lot of crud, a lot of death in the Bible, a lot of ill intent, a lot of killing, a lot of, a lot of bad stuff, right? Why? Because the Bible is not so much prescriptive or even proscriptive as it is what? That's right, descriptive. The stories in our Bible are descriptive in the sense that they show us how we are and how we can be. This is all of that. Verse 16. We're only gonna, I think I'll go to the end of the chapter here. Verse 16, when the report was heard in Pharaoh's house, Joseph's brothers have come. Pharaoh and his servants were pleased. Pharaoh said to Joseph, Pharaoh loved Joseph. Joseph was like so good. It's like, it was like Pharaoh felt so blessed to have Joseph, this Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Joseph, say to your brothers, do this. Load your animals and go back to the land of Canaan. Take your... Take your father and your household and, and come to me so that I may give you the best of the land of Egypt and you may enjoy the fat of the land. You are further charged to say, do this. Take wagons from the land of Egypt for your little ones and for your wives and bring your father and come. So he's like, Pharaoh's like, he's like laying out, <laughs> he's like rolling out the red carpet for the whole, the whole clan. Verse 20, give no thought to your possessions for the best of all the land of Egypt is yours. Okay, so that's the big invite. Um, and now uh, the, these last, uh, these last uh, eight, eight verses, 
um, uh, we uh, we get a little we get a picture of uh, what's going on with Jacob because uh, uh, that'll close out our, our, our lesson for today. Verse twenty one: The sons of Israel did so. Joseph gave them wagons according to the instructions of Pharaoh, and he gave them provisions for the journey. To each one of them, he gave a set of garments, but to Benjamin, he gave 300 pieces of silver and five sets of garments. <laughs> He's his favorite, of course. And he wasn't in on that plot, by the way. He wasn't in on that plot to sell it. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, you, you can get that, right? Verse 23, to his father, he sent the following, 10 donkeys loaded with the good things of each. <laughs> That's a euphemism. Uh, I, hope, I, I, I hope that we can remember that, those words as a euphemism for just really laying it on. 10 donkeys, what do you mean? I gave you 10 donkeys loaded with all the good things of Egypt. That's, the, that's what you're supposed to tell somebody the next time they don't, they're not appreciative of your uh, extravagant gift. What are you talking about? 10 donkeys loaded with all the good things of Egypt. Huh? Hello? <laughs> anyway. Um, and 10 female donkeys loaded with grain, bread, and provision for his father on the journey. Uh, he's want to make sure that his daddy is eating. Then he sent his brothers on their way, and as they were leaving, look at this, he said to them, do not quarrel along the way. <laughs> not only is Joseph embracing this wonderful transformation that God has wrought and bringing about the truth of his dream and allowing him to be of service to his brothers who did him so dirty. He is like, you know what? Be peaceful about all of this. Don't start kicking yourselves and saying, oh, wow, we were really idiots for that plan, weren't we? It's important to Joseph that they only see what's possible now, that they are also looking at the future. This is a great story. Don't, I just love the story. Verse uh, 25, so they went up to, out of Egypt. You go up out of Egypt, why? Why do you go up? It doesn't matter which direction you're going. You go up out of Egypt, why? Because of the elevation, it's low. You leave, you go up. There you go. So they went up out of Egypt and came to their father Jacob in the land of Canaan. And they told him, verse 26, Joseph is still alive. He is even ruler over all the land of Egypt. He was stunned could not believe that. But when they told him all the words of Joseph that he had said to them, and when he saw the wagons that Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of their father Jacob revived. Apparently, um, Jacob was down in the dumps for quite a while, uh, ever since uh, Joseph disappeared. Remember, he thought he was dead. And he was uh, a favored son. Uh, the sons of his favorite wife. There were only two, him and Benjamin. So, yeah. Israel said, uh, remember Israel is uh, the other name for Jacob uh, that he was given when what happened? Yeah, when he wrestled with that mysterious man, remember that? Uh, he says, oh, you shall no longer be uh, called Jacob, 
you, you shall be called Israel because you have wrestled with God. You have striven with God. Verse 28, Israel said, Enough! My son Joseph is still alive! I must go and see him before I die. I just love this story. I just think this is, this is like, this is like, this is an example of what, um, in the New Testament, there's this little theological principle called resurrection. What's resurrection all about? Resurrection is all about the same thing that happened here to Joseph. Um, ill intent on the minds of people and God transforming that. In transformation is not the same thing as intention or cause and effect. Not the same thing. Transformation is a total recreation of a possibility where in a realm of, there's no possibility that it exists. It just comes out of nothing. This is what Genesis 1 was about. This is what creation was about when God created the whole universe out of nothing. Transformation is something that comes out of nothing. There is no transformation unless we start with the hard, cold, and possibly even depressing facts about what is so. We have to start there. When we do, then we can find ourselves transformed. So this story of what happened with Joseph, yes, it is a kind of a, 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 a primer, if you will, for us. When we find, when we see in the New Testament what happened to Jesus, the fact that everything that happened to him, think about the last week of his life and the crucifixion, it was intended for evil. God transformed it. Was God smiling when all of the evil happened? No. But what God does is transform. When we're open to this, we don't need platitudes like, oh, everything happens for a reason. We don't need that. Because we have divine transformation available to us. <laughs> ah, I love that lesson. I think that, uh, I think that that is the most, one, I think that is the most valuable lesson in the entire Bible with regard to uh, uh, something that applies to our daily lives. And I know that there, all of us can identify with that kind of thinking, right? <sighs> all right, folks. I think that was a lot. And I love that. I hope you did too. Blessings on your day.